uh, short self introduction maxim shapochnikov director of advanced technology nutanics uh, i would say a one uh, term and one time employee in the company basically when i actually joined to the company it was like maybe 100 people now uh, the company is already more than 6000 people and i'm actually working in the r d department today uh, because of the um, knowledge and experience and uh, engineering engineering backgrounds so i'd like uh, <laughs> i'd really like to use and to share my knowledge uh, uh, with our customers and uh, partners and uh, employees and other people so um, initially we we tried to discuss with the conference organizers uh, maybe we should talk about advanced uh, DevOps uh, features and functionality but then we agreed that maybe it's a good idea to start from some uh, low level stuff uh, to start from basic things which are still uh, are really important uh, but still a lot of uh, engineers have spent including very good engineers don't really uh, know yet or maybe not understand yet uh, and um, one of the things i believe and we believe as a company uh, important to explain what's going on on the uh, I'd say enterprise markets today, uh, enterprise IT market, especially uh, bear in mind that last years, there is an ongoing silent revolution. Uh, basically, what happens, uh, a lot of uh, big, well-known uh, vendors, IT vendors especially, uh, they realized, they're struggling actually, and they realized that the technology they are selling uh, or any technology is not really working well uh, in many cases. And then, uh, in case we'll have a look, let's say, some fancy numbers, in case uh, we'll have a look at the um, Planetscape uh, web online businesses like Google, Facebook, Amazon, other big companies, they are easily operating by hundreds of millions of users or customers. Uh, or billions <laughs> and vice versa in case you take any modern enterprise IT technology uh, let's say very famous and very well known company VMware for example uh, in case you ask what is the maximum cluster size uh, today uh, and the answer will be 64 servers not thousand of service but just 64 and then uh, you can't scale um, scale out uh, and it's not only about VMware it's mostly about all vendors existent today but let's rewind time a little bit back and let's talk about some interesting stuff uh, it's just a screenshot Google search, just an easy to remember search query. Uh, why he who lost to Google? And in case someone is not aware, Yahoo actually lost because of Yahoo. Today is virtually a uh, non-existent company. Uh, the brand was actually uh, purchased by another company, but uh, they were actually uh, among, or I, I'd say, the number one online business uh, in the world. And actually, they one day they refused to buy Google for a few million dollars only. So this is the biggest mistake Yahoo made ever in their life. <laughs> uh, but what was the reason actually why Yahoo is so cool company, so big, so a lot of employees, a lot of genius engineers, and a lot of articles available online, but the conclusion uh, is normally they actually lost a technological war or technological battle. While Yahoo was relying on a traditional IT infrastructure like a storage systems, servers, some kind of uh, connectivity between storage and servers, Google was innovating. 
they were innovating and uh, they actually created, today I believe it's a Google DNA, uh, they actually created a foundation for the Google success. It's a Google distributed storage or distributed file system, Google distributed file system, or in short, Google file system. And uh, actually, because of that, uh, today, they've got like a lot of, like many billions of users, but they still can easily scale out. What does it mean scale out? We'll talk about it a bit later, but basically in case you'd like to add more capacity, like processing capacity or storage capacity, whatever, uh, you're just adding additional uh, capacity, just servers, uh, and then you're actually expanding. So Google basically, I don't know how much, but I believe they've got a few thousand data centers, virtually every single country. Uh, Google is actually installing their servers, and uh, in many cases, it's like multiple locations per country as well. So basically, uh, Again, it's a planet scale uh, approach, so it's a planet wide uh, operation. So, virtually every single country, maybe except North Korea, maybe something else, maybe Antarctica or Arctica, uh, but mostly every single country, uh, Google is actually there. And okay. Um, <laughs> and the image is all about uh, traditional IT today. And yeah, it's like um, a bit too much, but actually, in case you'll have a look at the um, traditional approach, it's normally like big enterprises, big um, businesses are using a lot of multiple vendors, a lot of technologies. Somehow it's all interconnected and somehow it's managed. Uh, normally it's like a lot of uh, management points, uh, management planes, and uh, as the result, for example, in case of Google, one engineer can easily manage 10 to 20,000 servers because of it's an literally a true DevOps approach. Um, traditional wealthy enterprises, the ratio is normally like a single engineer pure, maybe a hundred servers, not thousands, but a hundred servers, maybe. Sometimes uh, a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but again, we're talking about uh, uh, <laughs> different numbers and it's not only about service to manage but some engineers are managing network some engineers are managing uh, data stores some engineers are managing, managing uh, let's say visualization stacks today some uh, engineers added to they are trying to reorganize the mess to make it um, like DevOps approach or uh, let's say data center as a code approach. Uh, and the good news are that uh, actually the process is ongoing and uh, today I believe a lot of, and not only believe, but I know that a lot of big companies, big enterprises, wealthy companies, they are actually uh, uh, already uh, implementing uh, DevOps or SRE approach, and uh, they're quite successful in that. But still, it's a lot of work to do. I'll show some statistics, but <laughs> just a little bit fun. Um, maybe someone remember like some fantastic movie. Uh, mm, uh, with Bruce Willis, and it was a good phrase. American components or Russian components, it's all made in Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> the funny is again uh, about the modern world IT technologies. Um, majority of components, they are made by just a few components. Let's say CPUs. It's an Intel, AMD is coming back, and um, IBM power. And yeah, some smaller companies, but like just three companies. And obviously Intel is a leader by far today. Uh, flash memory, just a few companies like Samsung, uh, like Intel, a few other. Uh, memory, the same story. Hard drives, just a few companies. So basically um, all hardware components are mostly made just by a few companies. And by the way, a single company based in Netherlands 
ASML is actually controlling the whole silicon market because of they are actually making matrix. Uh, and without this matrix, it's not possible to produce any modern CPU at all. So a single company actually controls much more than 90% of market. And a sing single European-based company uh, actually controls all the um, biggest vendors, including, for example, they're working with Intel, they're working with uh, IBM, and uh, all other um, significant vendors. So it's just, um, it's not a secret, but not everyone is actually aware. And uh, it makes sense, actually. But uh, one more thing, which is really interesting. Uh, actually, five years ago, Gartner predicted that web scale IT will be actually used in like more than 50% of global enterprises. So basically, web scale IT, the prediction was it will be used by the majority of the biggest uh, world companies. And de facto, <laughs> the number is overachieved. Today, in case you'll take, let's say, Nutanix, uh, in case you'll take top 100 global businesses, um, as far as I remember, roughly about 70% of the companies are already using our technology or web scale IT. And uh, the description is quite precise, by the way. So um, basically, web scale IT, what does it mean? It's an uh, architectural approach, uh, engineering approach, uh, invented by uh, massive online businesses. Because of they actually tried to use traditional IT, someone tried, like Facebook tried, uh, Yahoo tried and failed, uh, and then realized that it's not working for them many, many years ago. And uh, they actually started to uh, design web scale uh, technologies. And basically, it's really simple to understand. And because of, you know, it's like some phrase, uh, it's like everything new is actually well forgotten uh, uh, old technology, uh, in case of the technology. So uh, basically, uh, Google was among the first companies to realize that uh, in case of um, data proceeding, in case of an external data storage, uh, you'll be highly limited by the performance of the uh, storage and uh, connectivity between storage and the server and I.O. interfaces, input-output interfaces. So the idea was simple, actually, to uh, return back time in time and to uh, restart to use uh, localized data. What does it mean? It's basically to store data, to keep data at the local hard drives. So each server or computer, local hard drives or uh, flash drives, and then to uh, use uh, localized I.O. So not to be limited by an external storage uh, connectivity and the storage performance. But then and the problem is uh, about redundancy and shared access. How to make it uh, available not only for a local application and the local server, but other servers, other applications, and how to make it redundant. Uh, the answer was simple to create a Google file system. Basically, it's a software which is actually, instead of hardware, uh, actually uh, like 100% software defined technology, is uh, making da data redundant just by placing additional replicas um, somewhere. Uh, in the cluster or, let's say, some other servers. So basically, one copy kept locally to allow an application to work with the data at the maximum speed and to keep a few replicas, one or two or maybe more, uh, somewhere in the cluster. So basically, uh, they created a file system which is scalable without limits. So instead of a traditional approach to use some data stores. Uh, they actually created an unlimited uh, scalability and uh, extremely high level of uh, availability and redundancy. And additional good news, actually, even five years ago, Gartner already realized that DevOps approach 
basically DevOps, it's not an approach uh, in, invented uh, recently. Uh, let's say some projects we made 20 years ago, some online businesses, uh, actually <laughs> they were based on DevOps uh, ideology, but it was just a, a different name or no name. We just used an uh, um, <laughs> approach, uh, which is today, in many cases, named like a DevOps approach or maybe SRE. So, uh, some basic principles, uh, design goals. So, uh, fractional consumption. So, you, when you need some resources, you'll add some resources. Uh, no single point of failure. So, basically, <laughs> in case you touch any uh, component or remove it or destroy it, everything will continue to work. Uh, distributed everything, shared nothing. Basically, all data, all management planes, uh, all controllers, everything, 100%, must be distributed. No shared hardware components. All uh, infrastructure uh, silos must be uh, independent. Always on. In case of a good online uh, business, let's say like Google, you probably never see, okay, we are closed for maintenance. Because of five minutes, five minutes of closure, it means uh, maybe tens of millions of dollars losses. And maximum automation. Again, it's <laughs> this is the way to enable DevOps um, in the company. And uh, some basic assumptions. Uh, actually, any server can be used. Actually, Google, Facebook, and uh, major or biggest online uh, companies, they are using uh, self-made servers, I'd say, or uh, something like open compute platforms. Basically, open compute platform isn't just a specification and all vendors can actually make open compute compatible platform. Uh, no special purpose appliances, no specialized hardware, no, no special, specialized controllers. It's all made in software. It's just uh, CPU, most common is Intel, well, sometimes AMD, sometimes IBM power, and uh, a scale out approach, linear approach. So basically, install, instead of forklifting, forklift upgrades, let's say you'd like to expand your storage capacity, your, in the traditional uh, infrastructure, you'll add some more disks, maybe some more shelves, and then you'll be limited by uh, control performance and I.O. interfaces. But in case of a scale-out approach, you can add like uh, one server, one, uh, 10 servers, or a million servers, and your performance and capacity will grow linearly. And to rephrase, uh, it's a modern marketing term, hyperconverged. Hyperconverged basically, again, was invented, I believe, by Google many, many years ago. But last, I'd say, five to six years, it's an ongoing battle because of the market uh, itself uh, soon is going to be more than $40 billion uh, yearly. <laughs> And it's already many billion dollars. And every single modern v vendor and big vendor is actually claiming that they've got a hyper-converged solution. But don't be fooled by a term. It's maybe too fancy. Hyper-converged, again, it's simple. When you've got a compute resources and uh, data store resources, unified in a single server. Basically, it's really simple to understand. So you got, you've got hard drives or flash drives uh, or combined hybrid approach uh, and CPU and memory uh, unified in a single server. And then based on the smart software and a unified management stack, uh, <laughs> all your data is uh, available as a single pool. And again, it's a important uh, topic again it's a 100 percent software defined so in case of someone work with the traditional IT infrastructures it's obviously like a storage uh, controller it's like a rate adapter for example or rate controller with not an array for independent drives but modern architectures are uh, not rate architectures but rain architectures easy to remember it's rainy day uh, redundant array of independent nodes 
No, this is server running some specialized software. Uh, in our case, it's an Nutanix controller, or in case of a Google, for example, it's a Google file system. Uh, distributed everything, shared nothing. We already talked about. So basically, uh, uh, again, it's a key differentiation. Uh, everything must be 100% distributed. Self-healing, in case of any component failed, uh, the operating system or the software must be actually uh, aware about and self-heal. So basically restore redundancy level. Uh, and it, it is really important to understand as well because of, um, in a modern uh, IT enterprise world, still some vendors are trying to sell some highly redundant, highly reliable servers. For example, let's take really nice, beautiful uh, machine. It's like IBM mainframe. It's like one machine, it's a $10 million. Uh, it's highly reliable. But the issue is, it is not possible even theoretically to create a 100% reliable hardware. Uh, any hardware will eventually fail. And this is a big issue actually. And, but uh, in case your software uh, the, <laughs> was designed uh, uh, to maintain redundancy and to restore redundancy and to self-heal and to expect that uh, any single component can actually fail or multiple components can actually fail simultaneously, then uh, it's not a problem. And instead of investing money, like millions or tens of millions of dollars to uh, uh, create a reliable hardware, you better use some cheap hardware cheap servers, and then uh, uh, you'll do everything else in the software. For example, Google, it's not a joke, by the way, they, they're using extremely cheap servers, uh, with carton, <laughs> carton boxes, because of uh, they're not even trying to repair. Because of like in California, for example, um, one hour of an advanced engineer who can actually fix a mother motherboard, it's roughly $500 per hour. Uh, <laughs> to pay. And it's easier to ju just, in case of any server failed, it's just simpler and cheaper to thresh it away and to replace with another server. It will be faster, much faster and cheaper. And obviously API, full automation and analytics. Uh, for example, in case we'll take Nutanix, 100% of functionality is uh, available via RESTful API calls. And we can literally say that it's an, like a data center as a code or uh, as a software, you know, software defined data center. And even internally, all Nutanix components are actually using um, API uh, to work, uh, to exchange information. For example, Nutanix is the only operating system which is not only using virtualized uh, controllers, but also based on uh, uh, microservices model. For example, all Nutanix components internally are running in Docker containers. No, any other single operating system uh, on the market is actually doing the same. So uh, we just containerized and virtualized all operating system components. But we will talk uh, about that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, by the way, this is a good sample. Uh, Facebook shared the architecture back to 2014, as far as I remember. Uh, you can actually Google for it. So Facebook pod design or data fa center fabric design. So basically, it's all about uh, web scale, <laughs> um, uh, IT and web scale uh, IT approach. So let's talk a bit more about Nutanix uh, stack again. We've got so many functions, so many features, uh, like more than 30 uh, products in the operating system. Uh, today I'm talking about just a, some very basic stuff. And uh, in case of any questions, we'll be always happy to uh, discuss. But basically we've got a, a underlayer, which is a basically a Nutanix distributed file system, literally created by the same people, the same engineers uh, who created Google file system. In case you have a look at the Nutanix history, so you'll see that founders, are, some founders, they used to develop Google file system. So it's a compute storage networking. Then we've got a virtualization layer, security layer, con uh, containers. So basically Nutanix is a partner with Google and mm, 
We've got a functionality uh, built in. It's a microservices based on uh, Docker and Kubernetes. And uh, application mobility fabric and uh, one click automation uh, and uh, uh, IoT. <laughs> and <laughs> much more, actually. Uh, again, in case some, someone is interested, for example, uh, our IIG stack works at the Nutanix stand, and you can actually see how it works. And it's all running, uh, again, on microservices. It's all containerized. Uh, it's all running in Docker and managed <laughs> by Kubernetes schedule, uh, scheduler. Uh, so basically, again, just a few words, uh, Nutanix data fabric or distributed data storage. Uh, it's quite easy to understand. We've got a standard server, Intel, uh, AMD, or Power, IBM Power, with a local flash, local drives, <laughs> and uh, it's running one of the supported virtualization stacks. One of the stacks uh, is VMware, for example, but we actually created our own stack based on KVM, but it's like, it's already a long way ahead of KVM. Uh, <laughs> Quite a few improvements made, I'd say. I'll, I'll show just a few. But the idea is uh, we are actually supporting four virtualization stacks, so all virtualization stacks available today. And in case of someone <laughs> will say, okay, but virtualization today is not required anymore because of we've got lovely containers like, and all the fancy stuff and DevOps approach, it's all cool. But it's not really cool because of uh, containers by nature, by design, uh, are much better acceptable and welcomed to run uh, stateless applications. But in case of a heavy mission critical or business critical database, uh, like Oracle Rack, for example, or open source, like let's say Postgres, whatever, uh, it's not a good idea in many cases to containerize it. Uh, so that's why we can actually talk about hybrid approach. Still, a lot of applications uh, will be uh, hybrid. Uh, it means that partially they will run in a full-blown virtual machines or instances, in case we'll talk about, let's say, Amazon Cloud, uh, and partially they will be containerized. And it's all about security additionally, because of, in case of a containerized approach, uh, the security is managed by an operating system kernel. Normally it's Linux. In case of a full-blown virtualization, uh, you've got an additional layer. It's basically a, a hardware virtualization today, and uh, a lot of <laughs> protection technologies implemented in uh, uh, any modern CPU, like Intel, for example. So uh, PCI bus is virtualized in hardware, um, <laughs> I.O. is already virtualized, uh, CPU uh, supports virtualization in hardware. So uh, by definition, <laughs> full-blown virtualization is actually more secure than containers, or <laughs> let's say Docker containers managed by, let's say, Kubernetes or an other orchestration or scheduler engine. And uh, Nutanix virtual controller, CVM, basically running on every server, all servers in a cluster. So in case you've got, let's say, 100 servers in a cluster, then you've got 100 virtual, virtualized controllers, and internal components are running, running uh, in a, mm, Majority of components are containerized as well. So like inside of a virtual machine, we are running containers to separate all the processes and to make it more reliable and more secure. And then all controllers are actually using network, standard network, Ethernet, to talk each other to create a data fabric. And uh, because of the way we actually implemented it, uh, it's, an, it's based on NoSQL uh, approach, NoSQL databases. I'll show a few slides about uh, some interesting information, but uh, because we actually made it based on NoSQL, so metadata, a lot of other data stored in a NoSQL database, we don't have any scalability limits at all. So while traditional vendors, famous vendors, are talking about highly limited uh, numbers in case you'd like to create a cluster, for example, uh, including open source projects like uh, OpenStack, for example, uh, the approach we used actually, they don't have any scalability limits. 
and uh, a few words about like advantages and AOS. By the way, AOS it's an autonomous operating system. It's an uh, Acropolis operating system or Acropolis. So basically. <laughs> <laughs> All the information is available here. Uh, basically, we are distributing all uh, metadata and data cluster-wide, and uh, all data rights are always protected. So, for example, in, even in case of some failed components, like failed disk or failed nodes, uh, servers, uh, still we will continue to write data in multiple replicas. We will just use another uh, service. Uh, and it's really, really important because of uh, traditional storage systems in case of any failure, let's say drive failure, in many cases, um, while the system is uh, rebalancing and recalculating uh, uh, checksums for the traditional rate, it could be like hours or days sometimes. Nutanix normally uh, will restore full redundancy in a few minutes. Because of we are not using RAID technology at all, we will just start to use uh, other drives or nodes to write new data blocks, and we will actually recreate missing replicas, uh, lost replicas uh, somewhere at other um, sur survived nodes in the cluster. And a bit <laughs> of fun. For example, uh, I just mentioned we are using no scale approach. Literally, let's say Cassandra no scale database. I believe mostly everyone heard about Cassandra because it's like an, not a new project anyhow. It's really like I believe seven or eight years old. And uh, it, it sounds really easy just to take it and to do the same like Nutanix did. So let's take a no scale engine. Uh, and read Nutanix Bible. Like we've got a lot of information, so 100% of information available online. How Nutanix works, and then uh, we will do the same. Uh, the problem is uh, actually uh, it's a bit about data science, uh, compute science. Uh, for example, all majority of NoSQL databases are working. Uh, in one of the modes. The theorem is actually claiming uh, that, um, let's say, uh, big data, no scale databases today, uh, they are supporting obviously consistency, availability, partition toler and partition tolerance, but uh, just two parameters can be like 100% and one parameter will not be zero, but will be lower. So basically, let's say in case of a Cassandra, in case of a standard mode, uh, Cassandra will work in a eventually consistent mode. So uh, the data will be eventually consistent. So let's say some online service, you just uploaded a new photo, and then one friend of yours will see the photo immediately, and another one will see in a few minutes. Not a problem at all. But in case you're talking about distributed file system, inconsistent data, it's a, uh, it's a corrupted file system. So uh, it took a few years, literally, we released the uh, first product in two, by the end of 2011. The company was founded in 2009 to uh, rewrote the Cassandra engine. It's just a sample. So it took three years, uh, roughly three years, to uh, make it working for our purposes. And by the way, Notanix is highly respecting all licenses like GPL. For example, we are using a lot of GPL code, but we made a lot of improvements in many uh, open source products, and we are releasing sources to public. But in case of Cassandra, it's an Apache license, so we are not obligated to share our changes back. So uh, basically, uh, based on uh, highly modified and improved Cassandra engine, we made a um, file system uh, which is actually unique to enterprise market, but not, uh, not unique in terms of like Google or Amazon or Microsoft Azure, they've got their own file systems. Even Yandex in Russia, for example, uh, actually developed some kind of shared uh, file system, but you can't buy it. You can use it while you're using online services, but you can't buy it to run it in your data center on premises. And a few samples uh, 
we made uh, how we improved uh, traditional open source, let's say uh, KVM. Because of Nutanix virtualization stack is based on KVM QEMO. Uh, KVM is a Linux uh, uh, kernel driver for Intel and AMD, uh, and uh, QEMO is an actual virtualization layer. Traditional open source, for example, uh, IO path, Network I.O. and storage I.O., it's a single thread, unfortunately. And today, you know, in case of you ask someone, Jan, downloading some, let's say, files online, uh, what is faster, actually, to download BitTorrent from a, someone like a single, uh, or to download BitTorrent file from like 100 hosts? And then the answer is obviously 100 is faster. Because of the way IP designed, TCP IP designed, uh, in case of, uh, especially in, in case of a longer connections, longer distances, uh, IP is not able to if efficiently utilize whole av available I bandwidth. So you're, you've got an, like one gigabit internet, but in case of a single connection download, you can actually download maybe with a hundred megabits speed. And the same on a high level happens with, a, let's say, uh, tr traditional virtualization stacks. And it's not only about KVM, for example, in case you take fancy VMware or Hyper-V or some other, Big brands, uh, the problem is mostly the same. So uh, I.O. is mostly a single thread I.O. And what we actually did, it's a project Frodo with just a sample. We actually rewrote all I.O. subcomponents, let's say KVM subcomponents, to make it multi-thread. And it's just a small sample. So we actually rewrote all, mostly all major uh, components and uh, we made them uh, multi-threaded and uh, distributed. As a sample, two years ago we already been showing like a million IOPS uh, in a virtual machine on a shared data storage. Please don't mix, like you can easily install a local NVMe drive without shared storage. You can run a VM, you'll see some nice number, but for the enterprise, for the um, for any on big online business, data store must be shared because of multiple servers, multiple uh, applications are actually accessing your data store and uh, simultaneously accessing the same uh, data set in many cases, or maybe in majority of cases. So today, uh, with the new use of optimizations made, I'll show you, uh, we actually achieved much bigger performance, so a few million IOPS, which is outstandingly good. And it's a sample, what we are actually doing today. Uh, you know, Facebook developed a new NoSQL database for internal use. I believe someone already heard, it's a RocksDB. So we actually took a RocksDB engine and uh, again, improved it uh, and we made some changes uh, to optimize it for our own internal uh, use. And actually based on the RocksDB, uh, we uh, actually added some functionality like metadata locality. So not only data blocks localized, but uh, also metadata available locally. And then the performance today is just by software upgrade uh, improved by two times. So just our customers upgraded the operating system online or inline, and then uh, they've, see, they've seen twice better performance. And um, we've got a lot of other uh, things made and um, uh, a lot of other f functions made, but because of the time availability, uh, I'll spend a few minutes mm, on them. Continuization on uh, Kubernetes itself and uh, uh, what we actually did. So uh, the idea is simple. So a few years ago, we actually realized that in many cases, full-blown virtualization is not enough, and uh, microservices model or so serverless model or continuization. It's like multiple names describing the same mess. <laughs> uh, it's more efficient to run uh, your applications, especially uh, stateless applications. So applications are which are not actually saving data directly. Uh, 
to um, the data store uh, in a container. It's more efficient and it's much more agile. Uh, uh, you can scale out easily, so you can add like a few thousand containers in, uh, in a few seconds, for example. So it's a lot of advantages. There are some disadvantages, but it's <laughs> not today. But uh, we actually realized that it's a good idea to add the functionality to our operating system to support containerization. And initially, we actually used Docker Swarm. <laughs> then we realized that it's a wrong approach because of Swarm. It used to be a container war. It was uh, um, the situation like multiple uh, uh, container technologies and multiple container schedules uh, were uh, fighting for the market share. But then, as usual, Google on the white horse. <laughs> so they actually uh, opened internal container scheduler, Kubernetes engine. But Kubernetes is not a new product. It's actually a fourth generation, generation of uh, uh, scheduler. So it's used by Google internally for many years. They just opened it for public recently. And then today it's like close to 100% adoption rate. So market shares, Kubernetes is close to 100%. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we've got a, uh, Docker, so container technology, and the scheduler uh, or orchestration, container orchestration, uh, based on Kubernetes. But the issue is normally uh, Kubernetes is extremely complicated to implement, especially in case of, uh, let's say, enterprise companies, uh, because of they don't have uh, a lot of engineers uh, like who actually worked in um, online businesses uh, like Google. So for Google, it's not a problem, or for some R&D companies, uh, software development companies, it's not a problem, but for enterprises, it's a big issue. So what we actually did, uh, we took a Kubernetes engine, working together with Google, so it's non-modified Kubernetes, uh, and we actually uh, implemented it as a part of the operating system functionality. So basically, you can actually uh, enable containers in your environment in a few clicks, and then uh, to use container only or hybrid uh, uh, or virtualization only approach. So you can actually run hybrid applications and uh, all the fancy stuff like all the components required to manage, uh, to enable containerization in the company. Uh, it's more than 30 components, like all, a lot of uh, components, like open source components, uh, like Grafana, like uh, <laughs> monitoring tools, like Influx. So it's like hell of a lot of components you need, you need to maintain and to support. And the idea of the Nutanix uh, as a company and the operating system is to make it simple. And instead of uh, uh, trying to maintain uh, by, uh, by themselves, uh, to provide customers some ready to go uh, <laughs> operating system functionality. So, um, and by the way, uh, uh, Kubernetes is extremely stable today. Uh, Google is actually running mostly everything in containers. And uh, <laughs> in 2014, uh, they already uh, used containers at the Planetscape uh, uh, scale. So um, that's it. We've got a few more products. Uh, closely related to DevOps stack. Uh, basically, for example, Calm. Calm is an orchestration stack. So uh, you can actually uh, create a blueprint describing um, uh, all application lifecycle parameters, so deployment, scalability, destroyment, um, uh, and uh, it can be a complex application, can be a local cloud running on Nutanix operating system or not, it can be bare metal, it can be public cloud like Amazon, Google Cloud, uh, Azure. So basically, <laughs> Nutanix idea is uh, to become a number one operating system used uh, uh, in uh, 
uh, uh, majority of the companies, enterprise companies especially, or governments, uh, just to be a standard de facto, <laughs> uh, and uh, mm, to provide all required functionality. For example, another product we've got, it's an object storage. We just released it. It's fully compatible with Amazon S3. Uh, literally compatible with an Amazon API, but you can run it obviously in your data center on premise and it's already tested on uh, multi petabytes and multi billion object uh, scale. So everything Nutanix actually doing today is extremely uh, scalable and used by uh, like uh, extremely demanding customers. Um, for, I, I believe it's a public. Yeah, it's a public information. For example, the biggest Nutanix customer is uh, U.S. government, obviously. So, <laughs> including military forces and uh, a majority of. Um, U.S. government authorities, for example, some funny ca case in case of some uh, anywhere in the world, American forces deploying uh, uh, some uh, military uh, forces. They are actually deploying Nutanix clusters as well. Uh, they're literally parachuting them, and then in like in half an hour, uh, it's ready to go. So it's a mobile, uh, mission critical, and tactical data center, for example, and uh, it's powered by. Nutanix operating system, which is uh, a good sample. So we're talking about not even mission, business critical, but mission critical applications. And in many cases, we've got like really nice projects. And what well, actually uh, last two days, uh, I've got a lot of meetings in Riga as well because of uh, some interesting customers and some interesting projects already. Uh, people are actually interested about Nutanix technology. So I believe that is, and we've got a few minutes in case of any questions. Is there any questions?